Welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Kip Knight. Second time with Kip Knight. Kip, it's great to have you on the podcast again today. Thank you for joining me. All right, it's my pleasure. It's going to be fun. Kip, your book opens with an incredibly scary story about you in South Korea. Tell us that story. I was doing a lot of international travel. I worked for PepsiCo at the time. PepsiCo was very demanding, but also treated you incredibly well as far as travel policy goes. You got to fly business class and you stayed in the nicest hotels. This particular time I was staying in the Four Seasons. And as part of the gig with staying at a really nice hotel is they'll meet you at the airport with a chauffeur and a limo and take you to the airport. And so I'd been told that there was going to be a driver waiting for me right outside of immigration with a big official looking sign with my name on it. You know, I'd, I'd done this before. It wasn't the first time I'd, I'd had that kind of treatment. So it's you know, second verse, same as the first, walk out, see my name on the sign, go up to the driver, say, okay, I'm tip nine, let's go. I'm going to tell folks, if you're ever traveling internationally and things start to seem a little bit weird, you might want to just ask for some ID or do a double check because there are a couple of telltale signs I should have picked up on, but I didn't. The Four Seasons sign looked real and my name was obviously up there and, and how else would they know that I was coming? But the guy, first of all, was dressed like he had a Kmart suit on. It was a really cheap looking tie. And you typically, you know, if anything, chauffeurs dress better than I do. I mean, they tailor-made suits and really, you know, manicured and everything. This guy was not that. And then uh, he gave me some story as we were walking in the garage about how the limo wasn't working and we were going to have to take his car, which is really, you know, run down band. So look at this band. And, and that was like, a, oh my God, <laughs> you know, what is this? But, you know, I was tired. I needed to get to the hotel. So I figured, let's go. So as we're leaving the airport, you know, about 10 minutes into it, after a couple of inquiries as to, we don't seem to be going in the right direction. The guy informed me I was going to have to pay him a thousand bucks. And you know what? I wouldn't call it a kidnapping attempt, although technically maybe it is. But if it was a kidnapping attempt, it was an awful cheap kidnapping. Because if you're going to kidnap somebody, charge more than a thousand dollars. I would certainly have my company would cough up 10, maybe a hundred. I did some very quick mental calculations and figured this guy was an opportunist, probably not a kidnapper. I knew he didn't really know who I was. So I started to, you know, ask him that, do you have any idea who I am? Do you have any idea of what kind of trouble you're in? You know, the entire unified armed forces of the South Korean army and the U.S. is coming after you as we speak. And I was, you know, he wouldn't know. I, I just wanted to scare him into taking me back. And so he basically turned around the car after five minutes of rather animated arguing, stopped over the airport. I grabbed my stuff, jumped out. And at that point, I probably panicked because I started to imagine well, what, what might have happened or what could have happened. But anyway, it was a James Bond opening to the, to the book. Everything worked out fine. And hopefully a little bit of an entertaining way to get started on how to turn uh, risk into opportunity. I, I decided I was going to turn into an opportunity to, to get out of the van safely and get back to the airport. That is quite a, a story, Kip. So tell me, why did you decide to write this book and why now? What was the problem that you were trying to solve? Well, the reason I wanted to write the book is I have always enjoyed journaling, for lack of a better word. I've been really lucky to have done a lot of travel. I've traveled over 60 countries. And ever since I was a teenager, traveling over to Europe for the first time, at that time, it was literally all handwritten. Especially after anything would happen to me that was, I thought, interesting or noteworthy, I would just write it all down and, and collect it. And so my primary motivation for writing the book is I, I've had a pretty extraordinary career journey. And, and I say that in all humility. I think if I can pass along some lessons learned along the way, because it, it's been a roller coaster ride. I've had some really fun, you know, peaks. And I've also had some pretty discouraging times where, frankly, I didn't know how this movie was going to end. Why write it now? There's a real lack of optimism and, and hope in the world. If somebody can read this book and it gives them a little bit more courage or a little bit more imagination as to what might be, then it, it will have been well worth it. One mantra I've had my whole life, I read this in a 
dating myself here, a Reader's Digest article a million years ago, and it was, the title was intriguing. It was uh, the two most powerful words in the world and the two most destructive words in the world. And I've always remembered this. The two most powerful words in the world are what if. And I would say a lot of my life has been the answering the question, well, what if? And if you read the book, every time I've done something that's been, you know, either different or new or exciting, it, it the conversation started with what if we tried or what if we thought about or what if we did blank? And then the flip side of that, the most two destructive words in the world are if only. And one thing I've tried to do my whole life is not spend a whole lot of time looking in the rearview mirror, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, if only this, if only that, because that's wasted effort. If you take nothing else from this podcast, if you can just remember uh, those two words in your life, you know, what if, it opens up a whole world of possibilities as far as what paths you might take. So let's get into a couple of the lessons that you outline in your book. If, yeah. you, were to, if you were to pick one of them, which is your favorite, which like in terms of maybe positive lessons, which one of these lessons is your favorite or resonates the most with you? The book is organized according to 15 different virtues. You know, when you're writing a book, you've got a lot of decisions to make. You know, at first it was going to be, you know, it's not a biography, uh, although it's got a lot of stories about stuff that's happened to me. And at first it was going to be a chronological series of stories. But then one of my good friends said, you know, it, it might be fun to group these by virtue. And that way, if somebody had a particular virtue they were interested in, either it was something they wanted to get better at or something that they, frankly, thought they were pretty good at, it, but maybe they could raise their game. I, I just want to rattle off the virtues real quick just to give the listeners a, a sense as to what's in the book. Courage, gratitude, assertiveness, integrity, creativity, perseverance, tolerance, greatness, respect, resilience, patriotism, agility, honesty, empathy, and helpfulness. And I was a Boy Scout. We had 12 virtues we talked about. And some of those overlap with these. But those are 15 virtues that I've got a number of stories and lessons learned. To answer your question, I think the one that I you know, like to share with the readers as far as uh, my favorite was chapter on honesty. And that chapter is uh, one about uh, spending a weekend with Tony Robbins. I was invited by Tony Robbins and his organization to actually come to this thing for free to evaluate their program because they wanted to attract more corporate sponsors and corporate participants. Because most of the folks that go to Tony Robbins do it on their own or they own, own a small business and all that. I, I don't want to give away the punchline, but let's just say that it, it took a certain amount of courage for me at the end to be totally honest with them as to what, you know, what they could expect forced me to be honest about my own career and where I wanted to go because I was struggling with the idea of going into business for myself, having worked for corporations for 25 years. And, and that weekend was transformative because it, it did give me the courage. And I give Tony Robbins the credit where it gave me the courage to say, I'm, I'm going to create my own company, Night Vision Marketing, which started back in 2001 and still is going strong. So that would be the chapter. If you're only going to read one chapter in this book, Read the chapter 13, The Model and Honesty, and my weekend was Tony Robbins. So let's talk about one of the lessons in your book that may have been a little bit more painful or difficult for you. Yeah, there's a chapter in there on resiliency. You know, for a long time, you know, it was tough for me to talk about, but I was CMO at Taco Bell, but I was also fired, you know, as CMO at Taco Bell. I was on the job for about a year and a half, and some of which you know, were control, some of which were in my control. You know, I, I was fired at spent about 18 months trying to figure out, you know, what my next gig was going to be. You know, looking back on, I was tough. We were in the middle of a recession. You know, we just moved out to California a couple of years earlier. We had a, a big mortgage, kids in private school, didn't exactly have a lot of money socked away. Again, one of the more valuable chapters in there, because I'm really big on quotes, especially Churchill quotes. One of his quotes is, uh, if you're going through hell, keep going. The toughest part about resiliency is you don't know how it's going to end. But looking back on it later on, you, you can be very objective, and reflective and all that. But man, when you're in the middle of it, it's, wow, I don't know if this is the worst or the, this is the good part. And the, the really bad stuff is going to happen, you know, next week. And, and for a number of people listening to your podcast, I would encourage you to, again, read that chapter and reflect upon what some of the lessons learned you have observed from other people and, and from your own life. Because again, I don't know who said it, but I think it's absolutely true. Misfortune or challenges don't 
build character, they reflect character. So you really get to discover what you're really made out of when you're in the toughest of times. And the corollary to that is you get to find out who your real friends are. Because the, the amazing thing to me about having been a CMO at a large corporation and then be ex-CMO, for a lot of your supposed friends, it's like you, as if you contracted leprosy, getting phone calls returned or emails returned and all that. And so your core group is the one that sticks with you. And therefore, and it is not a virtue that I, I've written a chapter on, but it's a theme throughout. You know, loyalty is really important. And one of the things I took away from that whole time in the desert, so to speak, was if I've got a friend that's out of work, uh, I will actively reach out to them on a regular basis to check in, see how they're doing, you know, give them some tips, some networking, some encouragement, because th those people are the most sacred people you have when you're going through the tough times. And if I can just pay back, you know, by doing that, because uh, I had a couple of folks do the same for me, that's extraordinarily uh, invaluable. And, and especially as you get older and you look back on your life, those are the things you're going to feel the best about, you know, when you were helping people out in their darkest hour. I, th I think that's actually a really amazing response, Kip. The decision that you made to reach out to those who are going through tough times like that, I think that's really commendable. And, you know, when we go through times like that, I actually myself had a time where it was actually in the, in the middle of 2020, March yeah. 31st, 2020, I was actually laid off from my job and mm -hmm. senior manager did all the right things, <laughs> raised up new leadership, did everything correctly, knew all the right people, knew all the things to say, but still got the result that I didn't want. Right. And having gone through that myself, I absolutely agree with what you said in terms of the people that you remember those people. Right. That stuck with you during those tough times. Yes. Absolutely. And, and, and one other thing, and I've, I've been this way my whole life. My, my mom was the ninth child born in 1930. They were dirt poor. I, I don't know if it was genetic or just you know, my story she would tell, but I've always been very self-aware when it comes to personal finances and always made sure that we had a fallback plan in terms of savings or or resources. And one other thought I would give to anybody on, on listening to this podcast is pay yourself first. You know, I've always had a passion about personal finance and I've got certain, you know, rules that I live by in terms of six months of cash available at any time, so no matter what, no ongoing credit card debt, pick a number in terms of what your goal is on net worth and, and invest against it and track it and monitor it. But boy, I tell you, it, it's tough enough to be out of work, but what's really bad is if you're out of work and you're really starting to freak out over, you know, am I going to be able to pay the bills or am I going to have to start dealing with some of the, you know, uh, sleazier, you know, financial institutions out there with payday loans and all that and dig your well before you're thirsty. And, and so making sure you're disciplined enough on the financial front that if things take a turn for the worst, you can get through that because that is what saved me. I, I had enough saved up and, and enough resources that I, I never spent any time worrying about the financial side. I focused more on the career side and, you know, you eventually get back up on the horse, but you got to make sure you can do it without some permanent damage either to your psyche or your credit score. Where did you end up landing after Taco Bell? eBay. Yeah. And, and that's also in the book in terms of how that happened. One other tip I would give everybody that I've learned my whole life is it's a bit of a cliche, but man, is it true? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And, you know, I am networking on a daily basis and hopefully not networking in a gland handling kind of way, you know, sucking up and all that, but genuinely trying to connect people, talk to people, you know, be open. To, I've got a coaching business now. And so I, I do that on a regular basis. The way I ended up at eBay was, uh, ironically, I ended up working with the same guy for 20 years in, in three, in four different companies. We started together at PepsiCo and then we went to Yum and then we went to eBay. And then I ended up following him out to uh, H&R Block. Be good to your boss. You never know. And if you get a good boss, count your blessings. Because as I talk about in the book, I've been really lucky. I've probably had 20 bosses in my career. I'd say 17 of them have been fantastic. Three of them, not so much. But ironically, I've learned more from the three horrible bosses than I probably did from the others because I just, I learned firsthand what I would never do or what I would not do because I know what it felt like. Would you say there are more good bosses or more bad bosses 
out there? You've had your sh fair share of exposure to yeah. different companies and well, at the senior level. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody intentionally gets up at the start of the day and goes, I'm going to be a, a really bad boss. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be the one that you know people hate. I, I think there are way too many uh, bosses who have never really trained for the role. I mean, you know, they wake up one day and all of a sudden they've got a team and they've never been instructed on how to manage a team, how to motivate a team, how to discipline a team. And and I would, rather than good or bad, I would group bosses into two groups. One is those that manage by fear and the other is that manage by, for lack of a better word, love or positive energy. And I, I think anybody listening to this will instantly know what I'm talking about. The ones that manage by fear are the ones who, you know, you're always, you know, watching your back and, and, and paranoid that the next email or the next phone call is going to be, you know, the bomb. If I could coach the, you know, those kind of managers, I would say you're never, ever going to get any incremental effort from your team by managing that way because they're always concerned about, watching their back and they're never going to go above and beyond the call of duty. Why would they? There's no upside for them. They're only going to be looking at the downside. Whereas if you're a leader that is, in fact, I think a great definition, truly fantastic manager is a manager that cares about their people, even when that person doesn't really think much of themselves. In other words, you fail, you're down there on the floor, you're crawling, you're, you just, you're having a pity party. And the manager comes over, you know, grabs you by the arm, picks you up, you know, maybe shakes you a little bit, goes, snap out of it. Come on, you're better than this. Let's get back in the game. And then you go off and you do your best work ever. You know, those are the great managers. And everybody's got it within themselves to either be, you know, the manager from hell or the manager that people later on say that was the best person I ever worked for in my life. A little while ago, you wrote an article about really good managers and the kind of questions that managers ask, what are some of those questions that really good managers ask? I wrote an article or blog about, oh, three years ago in which I said, you know, there are five questions that great managers regularly ask their people. And I, let me go ahead and just share those five questions real quick. And I would ask the listeners to the podcast to, to if you're a manager, when's the last time you asked your team members these questions when you were having your annual review or maybe your regular one-on-one. -on -one. Or if you're an employee, if you've never been in this conversation, hey, don't be shy, you know, write these down and go to your blogs and say, hey, let's have a conversation. Here are five questions I want to talk about. So question number one, here's what we appreciate about you. You know, when you're hired, it was for a reason. You know, you either had a skill set or experience or an aptitude for something. I like to say, you know, everybody's got at least one superpower. So what is that superpower? And let's not forget about that superpower. And you're better off leveraging your superpowers during your career as opposed to trying to manage your downsides. Michael Jordan was the world's greatest basketball player. Yeah, not so much for baseball. Question number two, what have you done to improve yourself in the past year? And what have you done, you know, and what have you learned about yourself in doing that? You know, we're all works in progress. I think that self-reflection is very important. And I think that conversation between a boss and manager about, you know, especially like an annual review, you know, what have you done for self-improvement and, and what does that taught you? Question number three, and, and this one's maybe a little bit more painful, but it's really important. What could you have done better in the past year and why? Nobody's perfect. Everybody, you know, either falls short of what they could do or they, they screw up. And I've learned infinitely more from my failures than my successes. But the important part is to capture that and to think about that and to make sure that, you know, you tuck that, you know, in the back of your mind. And next time you're in a similar situation or somebody's facing that same challenge, maybe you pass along that wisdom and save them some heartache. You know, what could you have done better? Question number four, and boy, this one, uh, especially for younger folks is so, so, so important. Where do you see yourself in 12 months and where do you see yourself in five years? If you don't have a path, any path will do. And, you know, again, making sure that you don't wake up one day and you're 40 years old and, you know, half your life is gone and you haven't really figured it out yet. That's not good. That's, I'm not saying it's too late, but the sooner you can start setting some short-term and longer-term goals for your career, the better. With one caveat, I, I don't think anybody is really going to have the knowledge or the foresight to look 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road and map everything out. God knows I didn't. I couldn't. I mean, the internet didn't exist. And half the stuff I've done is based on the internet. 
So you've got to have enough flexibility there to do some pivots or mid-course corrections, but you certainly should have some type of a goal in mind that you're striving for and working for. And then finally, the fifth one, and boy, this is the one that separates to me the great managers from the not so great managers. What can I as your manager do to help you get there? Because that opens up the conversation for somebody to say, hey, there's this seminar I wanna sign up for, there's a course I wanna take, or there's a special project I've been interested in. And it is up to that manager to go try to make that happen within reason. If somebody quits or fails at a job, it's not totally on that person. It's also the responsibility and frankly, the fault to that manager for that person not making it. So those are the five questions. And again, if uh, anybody picks up the book and checks it out, it's in the epilogue. I, I would really encourage you guys to have those conversations. There's a lot of heart in those questions. It really transcends the job and the job description and really humanizes the interaction between leader, manager, and employee. And I really appreciate those questions a lot. I think any manager, whether they lead from fear or lead from a place of encouragement or positivity, yeah. I think they could pick up those questions and really, I think they would be, it would be transformative for their leadership if they had at an annual conversation included those questions within the, the body of their performance review or just a conversation with each of the people who works for them. Really great questions there, Kip. Thanks. Yeah, I think it'd be one of those frank and honest and probably enjoyable conversations a manager could ever have with their employees because they, people are dying for this stuff. And for most employees, it's going to be intimidating to try to bring those questions up if the manager does it. But I'd say, you know, get a little bit of courage and, and literally just you know, shoot them an email, say, hey, here are five questions I want you to ask me next time we talk. See what happens. How do leaders turn risk into opportunity? Well, it goes back to that what if question or what if statement I made. I've had within my career, oh, any number of situations where you're at a crossroads, you can go left or go, you know, one option might be what I would call the safe path. Uh, and the other is, you know, what's behind door number three. You know, it, it could be incredible or it could be you know, not so good. And if I thought I had a 70% chance of pulling something off, I would typically go for the road less travel because the way I've always thought about it is, you know, even if it doesn't work out, the lessons I will learn from this will be invaluable. And at the end of my life, I don't want to look back like so many people unfortunately do. And the biggest regrets would be what you didn't do as opposed to what you did. So it's a little bit of a philosophy. I'm not advocating jumping off cliffs and, and taking you know stupid chances on things, but I would encourage people to be a little bit more courageous and imaginative in terms of what their future might be, and don't necessarily always take the safe route. You know, take the route that uh, has got some exciting upsides, and, and the downsides are manageable, and the learnings are, are infinite. So it's more of a philosophy of life than anything else. That's how I've tried to take, you know, when I've got a risk, I, I've tried to look at it in terms of what are the learning opportunities, what are the growth opportunities here. And from a financial point of view, I definitely think people who make a lot of money, they, they can't entirely attribute it to hard work or anything else. Luck and timing have a lot to do with it. But I will tell you that if you are of the mindset of going out and trying new things and learning new things and networking, your odds of being financially successful are frankly much better than those people that are always going to take the same from. That's very encouraging, actually. So I want to pivot a little bit and discuss just some general advice and lessons learned questions with you. What would you say is your cause in life? If you had a, a mission statement what would it be? Or what's that thing that you're fighting for most? You know, like I said, I was, I'm an Eagle Scout. And, you know, not only was I active in scouting as a teenager, but both my sons, I'm very proud to say, were, are, you never were, you always are an Eagle Scout. It's like a, a Supreme Court, you know, uh, appointment is for life. You know, you're always an Eagle Scout. And, and the Scouts had a motto, which basically said, always leave a campsite in better shape than you found it. And if, if I had a philosophy of life, it would be, you know, you, you know, Jimmy Stewart, a wonderful life and all that had two realities and one you were in the world and one you weren't, hopefully the one in which you were in the world was a little bit better off than if he hadn't been. 
I mean, that goes across the board. That goes in terms of your family, in terms of your work, in terms of your networks and your friends and everything else. You just try to, you know, make the world a little bit better off than it would have been if you hadn't come along. What are you most concerned about for the world? The thing that concerns me the most is our inability to seem to agree on, on much these days. And there are some existential questions that are facing us as far as like climate change is probably the biggest one that yeah, you, know, you think about, you know, not only for yourself, but much more so I'm, I'm a grandfather and I've got two grandkids and, you know, what kind of world we will need for them. And, and we're living on borrowed time. You, you read all the science and it's not like you've got forever to figure this out. There's a closing window there. And if we don't, you know, take some very, fairly dramatic action fairly soon, people are going to look back later on and I think curse our generation and say, you know, what were they thinking? Why didn't they do the simple things? And, and that's going to be an indefensible, you know, situation that, you know, we can't really answer for. So there's that, you know, there is a, a growing disparity between, you know, income. There's also, I think, some, some real threats to democracy. We've historically just taken elections for granted and, you know, and except for the fact that people can see elections that they don't win and all that. And if that's all up for grabs, you know, Katie bar the door, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So hopeful that, you know, the younger generations are going to, you know, be a lot better at this than the current leadership generation and be able to recognize that, you know, the common threats are the glue that's going to bring everybody back together. And, you know, if you got to make some sacrifices, they're, they're mutual sacrifices. They're not just some people sacrificing other people getting a free pass. And, you know, again, as a student of history, I know that sometimes you've got to go through, you know, a bit of a valley before you can go back up to the mountaintop again. You know, you look at the Great Depression or World War II and, and what came out of that. And I, I don't know if I'd call it the greatest generation or not, but I, I think a lot of those folks stood up when they were needed and, and did the right thing and everybody benefited because of it. I'd like to think that we can do that again. What advice would you offer, not just that younger generation, but anybody on, on the personal side of things in terms of health, marriage, kids, and the like? Well, I think there's a Tao expression and the journey is the reward. And, you know, if I had to boil it down to, to one Zen thought for the day, and that would be it because... I think folks spend way too much time, you know, getting consumed in, you know, jealousy or envy or, or, or not feeling grateful or, you know, uh, a sense of gratitude about what they've currently got. Unfortunately, you know, social media doesn't help that one bit. Sometimes you question the motivations of some of the people that are posting on social media in terms of you know, the, the humble brag or just the brag, you know, hey, look at me, you know, life is perfect. And guess what? Reality check number one, nobody's life's perfect. I mean, there's always going to be something everybody's dealing with. And the second thing is, frankly, even as we look over the last couple of years, I'm, I'm an extrovert by nature. I, I love meeting people. I love speaking in front of a crowd. I love traveling. I haven't done any of that in the last two years. And, you know, that could be, if I wanted to, I could really sulk and, and be depressed and all that about it. But, you know, you turn inward and, and you spend the time finishing a book that I've been working on for the last 10 years or, you know, doing more bike rides or swimming more or, you know, reaching out to friends you haven't talked to in a long time. So enjoy the ride. You know, the ride is going to be over before you know it. I, I've been reminded of that in the Last week, I had a, a friend die in their sleep. You know, I've lost enough friends now to know that, you know, th this ride at some point for everybody is going to end. Sometimes abruptly, sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you know it's going to end, and sometimes it just it sneaks up behind you. When it's all said and done, I would hope that most people would spend their energy reflecting on the good stuff they've got, you know, the friends, the family, the experiences, and not waste any energy on the jealousy or the the name calling or the, you know, the hatred, you know, that they, you know, spend against other people. Because if you step back and you try to be somewhat mature about it, that just seems kind of silly. You know, why waste your time doing all that stuff when there's so much to be grateful for? I totally agree with you that life is just, it's too short to get caught up in, in the, the petty jealousies and the negativity and things like that, that really the core essence of a happy life is gratitude. <laughs> you just said that. 
And I feel so grateful that you and I get to spend even a moment of this life, you know, together on this uh, podcast and uh, that you and I have uh, crossed paths here, not just once, but twice and actually several times outside of this. So I'm glad that you and I get to share a piece of this life journey together. So I feel that privilege for myself. I do want to close out with this question. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you or anything else that you want to share uh, before we close it out here today? I think to close it out, one of the um, questions that I ask my friends as I was writing the book is if you could go back and give your 25-year-old self some career advice, you know, or, or, or like advice, really, what would that be? And I was blown away with the wisdom, you know, the variety, the, the reality of, of what they wrote. And there's this section of the book that I call, you know, Moment of Zen. And on the audio book, it's kind of fun. We have all these, you know, chimes come in as your moment of Zen. But I would encourage folks to, if you're reading the book, really spend some time looking at that section because that's the collective wisdom of about 30 of my friends that I have put together all their thoughts. But even if you don't read the book or even if you don't read that section, you know, as you get older, and, and you're trying to coach your, your kids or your friends' kids or your younger employees, you know, ask yourself that question. What advice would you give your 25-year-old self, you know, as you look ahead? Because, you know, on-the-job learning is typically the most inefficient way to go. I, if you can pass along some wisdom or some tips or some lessons learned, not in a preachy, you know, heavy-handed kind of way. You just say, hey, you might want to think about, you know, as you're preparing for such and such. That might be one of the most valuable things you ever do for somebody. Because, you know, the biggest tragedy when you're coaching is when you hear somebody say, well, I didn't even know, or I had no idea that was an option, or why didn't anybody tell me about, you know, such and such. So think about that question. And if you have some wisdom to pass along, you know, don't be shy, you know, pass it on. Right advice at the moment of need. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think we all could learn from that too. That's a, it's quite a question to close out with. What advice would you give your younger self? Excellent. Absolutely. Kip, it's been such a pleasure uh, talking with you. For my audience, the book is Learn to Leap, How Leaders Turn Risk into Opportunity. Go out and get this book. It's so worth it. Kip, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together today. Mark, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.